Thanks for listening to the Media People Podcast, lively and insightful chats with the people who power the media industry. I'm your host, Victor Genova. For more episodes, you can go to soundcloud.com slash media people podcast, or you can subscribe on your favorite podcast service like Apple Podcasts or CastBox. Views expressed by participants are personal. If you ask Jamie Schwella, president of Blue Ant Media, what some of his interests were growing up, without hesitation, he'd answer pop culture and entertainment. He was, after all, voted most likely to co-host Entertainment Tonight by his high school peers, so it's only fitting that he would build a career in the entertainment industry. Born and raised in Montreal, Jamie's university career took him from Canada's second largest city to Waterloo, Ontario, a town with roughly one-twelfth the population. He studied communications and history, but immersed himself in extracurricular activities like DJing at the campus pub and working at the campus radio station. Radio was Jamie's gateway into the entertainment world. He would return to Montreal in the summers, working in the promotions department for what was then known as Mix 96 Radio. He continued in radio after graduation, choosing to relocate to Toronto where he handled promotions for CHFI. From there, he moved into marketing management and leadership roles at Alliance Atlantis, Canwest, and Shaw Media. So what's the secret to Jamie's success? He challenged himself to work on brands where he wasn't the target, but also credits having great mentors along the way. Well, Blue Ant Media, seven-year-old company, is we call it an international content producer, distributor, and channel operator. So really what that means is we create what's basically TV content, long-form video. Uh, we create it around the world. We sell it around the world to all kinds of media companies, the traditional broadcasters, the streaming players, you name it, whoever's looking to create and, and, and broadcast content or, or uh, run content. And we're also a channel operator. So that means we run linear channels, SVOD op- apps, and all kinds of different things. My role is I run our Canadian business. So I'm in charge of what is here, eight linear cable channels, national channels in Canada, our print magazine, Cottage Life. We have what we call a consumer show business related to Cottage Life. So we have an events business uh, four or five times a year. People come to different uh, exhibition halls and buy things related to one of our brands, be it Cottage Life or Makeful or some of our channels. So it's part of our events business. And we have a digital business, a lot lot of it offshoots of our broadcast brands, uh, but we do a bunch of digital publishing related to our brands. So anything we do in Canada, I have responsibility for. Let's go back to the beginning. Where are you from? I am from Montreal. I was born there. Grew up, uh, spent 18 years in an awesome city, uh, went actually to the same high school, elementary school and high school, right through from grade three to grade 12. So had a pretty good ride with uh, a good group of friends right through. And then when I was about 17, I decided I wanted a bit of a change. So I actually left Montreal just to have a different sort of experience and went to university in Kitchener-Waterloo. Different province, different size school, everything. That surprises me a little bit because when I was going to university, the one thing I kept hearing from my friends that were born and raised in Quebec were the Quebec tuition rates. So you forego the Quebec tuition rates, you pack up, and you move to Ontario. Yeah, so this was 20 years ago now. I mean, bear in mind, everybody wants the university experience. And part of the – Montreal is an awesome city. My family's still there. I go back often with my kids to visit, and, and it's just such a fun city. But ultimately – most people want to leave home. I mean, that's sort of not everyone, but I, I wanted to leave home for university and have that sort of full experience of living on your own with a group of friends and a different vibe. So for me, that meant packing up and leaving Montreal and heading to what was a, a different place, Kitchener-Waterloo. I liked the idea of a small school. They had a program I was interested in, but it, it was really to have that full university experience. Was there a bit of culture shock moving from Montreal to Kitchener-Waterloo? I ask because Emily Bailey, the previous guest uh, on the podcast, she went to get. She went to Wilfrid Laurier University as well. Yeah. But she was coming from Grand Bend, so a town of one thousand people. You're coming from one of Canada's biggest metropolitan areas to what is? I don't want to. It's not called a small town per se, but it is one of the smaller cities yeah. in Canada. So, yes, in that I met people from walks of life that I hadn't met historically from small towns, from big towns, e- even Ontario and Quebec, as we know, very different cultures, very different provinces, just fundamentally. So I met different people. I thought that was great. For me, I love the idea of not being with the same group of people. I, I love my friends at home, but wanted to change. And so finding people from different backgrounds, different cultures, different experiences growing up, that was great for me as well. And I liked the intimacy of what Laurier and, and the size of it at the time. Um, so that all checked boxes of things that I was looking for. What did you study at Wilfrid Laurier University? So I, one of the reasons I went there was early on, this gets back to high school a little bit, I always had a fascination in media and entertainment. I was somewhere along the way at the end of, uh, at the end of high school, 
uh, voted most likely to co-host Entertainment Tonight. So I think John Tesh was the host back when I was growing up. And this is before we even had Entertainment Tonight Canada, because so I there, used to watch that too. There was no Entertainment Tonight Canada. In fact, you know that follows me to later in my life, and we could talk about my experience with ET Canada in global, because I was there when it launched uh, back in 2005, actually. Uh, but yes, in the old days, there was just good old Entertainment Tonight with Mary Hart and John Tesh. And I, I always had a fascination in movies and TV and entertainment and pop culture. I, I carry that very early on, watched way too much Cheers and a lot of shows out of the 80s. And uh, so when I, when I looked for university, I was looking, one of the things I was looking for beyond a small school in a certain environment was a communications program. And Laurier had a, uh, at the time and still is a great comms program. So the fact they had that offered a, a degree in that was really of interest to me. And I got there and also decided to do a double major, and so I, I had an interest in history. I, I've always had a bit of an interest in poli sci and history, current events. That's another sort of passion of mine to this day. I watch way too much CNN, as many people at work know, and uh, just love keeping up with, with uh, current events. Anyway, I decided to take a double major at Laurier, and they offered a great history program as well. So I did a double major. Uh, history, I thought, would be helpful if I ever wanted to be Jeopardy champion down the road, which was of interest to me and back to my pop culture roots. But, but really, comms is what drove my interest to go there and really was one of the focus of a lot of my time there as well. Tell us a bit about your extracurricular activities uh, in university. Yeah, so uh, maybe as an extension of my passion for media and communications, I found a couple things that were sort of nice offshoots of that. So early on, I was recruited to work as a DJ at the campus bar. So we had a bar that was open three, four nights a week right on campus. It had different theme nights. So there was kind of hip hop dance nights and there was classic rock and uh, 90s alternative rock at the time. And the hip hop dance thing was not my scene. I didn't have a lot of expertise in that, I will say. Uh, but I knew classic rock, uh, which is one of the nights we did and uh, had a good sense of alternative rock. And uh, I was actually recruited first actually to work at the uh, campus radio station and then from that quickly to be a campus DJ. So did the DJ thing, which was I did it through four years of university, being paid to go to a bar a couple nights a week and where my friends were as well and hanging out and getting paid for it while others were having fun was actually a great university job. I really enjoyed that four years of DJing. And you're the center of, the ten of attention when you're the DJ. You People do. must have stopped you yes. in class and be like, Jamie, can you get me in Thursday night or Wednesday you, you, night? You, 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 people come to the DJ booth and they see you there. And uh, there's, a fun, there's a fun aura around that, which was a fun thing to do. Um, and then, I mean, to your other question, I also did work at the campus radio station, started just, just – again, out of an interest in passion in radio and in media, uh, had a show, did that over a couple of years, eventually took over. And for the last I think, two years of university was the program director of that campus radio station as well. So all in this audio, radio, vision, media kind of space um, and just different out, uh, outlets for my interest in that. And you were a DJ when the D still meant discs. Yes, I had CDs. In fact, I would literally, uh, we didn't have laptops and Apple Music and all the stuff that I assume DJs use today. Yeah. I literally would go to gigs every, you know, from my house in big plastic bins of CDs uh, and take the CDs to the bar and carry them home at the end of the night. And it was, and you had to kind of make sure you had the latest music and get the latest hits as they were released to keep your CD collection kind of current. Uh, and that, I just would haul them night to night. So that was part of it. I still have actually at home big bins of CDs. I, 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 if you ever you know, look at my CD collection, it's really good from like 1993, 94 to 1998 when I finished university. Uh, it's obviously different after that when, when I started doing other stuff, but I have a real uh, time capsule of that in CDs. Look, hang on to those. I was at Sunrise Music yesterday and I couldn't believe how vinyl was making a comeback. Yeah. Vinyl's making a comeback. CDs are kind of around now, too. Um, it's all that. That's kind of it's interesting. tangible. People want yeah. to know that they own something from their favorite musician. For sure. So I have good songs and uh, kitschy, not-so-great songs for that <laughs> collection, but uh, it was fun. But even some of your earlier jobs, that was rooted in entertainment as well. I mean, you cite working at a video store. Is one of your first uh, one of your first gigs ever? Yeah, so so my, I think my first literal paid job was I worked as a camp counselor one summer. I must have been fifteen or sixteen, kind of the early days of when you could be a counselor. So I did that for one summer, but I think that year or very quickly also got a job in what was then video stores. We had places where people would go rent VHS tapes on shelves. I know it's, it doesn't exist anymore. I remember those stores yeah. so vividly. They were yeah. kind of like entertainment hubs. Yeah. You wouldn't just go in to rent one video. You'd be there for about 30 minutes playing video games, deciding what to get. They yeah. were loaded up with food. 
Yeah, so, I mean, it was fun. I worked at kind of a small local video store in Montreal, did that for a couple summers uh, between high school jobs and even, I think, out of first year university, I did that. And it was great because, again, I was paid to hang out in a store, watch movies all day, talk to people about movies. Um, so as a kid that loved entertainment and pop culture, another great way to make money. It was super fun to do that. Uh, and, and then, of course, through university, I pivoted my interest in radio, my experience in radio at Campus Bars to do radio jobs in Montreal between summers as well. So that was sort of the next foray of my entertainment and radio kind of connection. That radio job in Montreal, which station was it at? Okay, so it was a station then called Mix 96, now today called Virgin Radio as part of the Bell Media Group. Okay, an old Astral station. Uh, old or was Astral it standard media, or standard radio it at the time? It may have been standard at the time, actually. I think that's okay. right. Uh, and so I, wor I got recruited uh, to, to work in the promotions department. So I worked for a couple guys uh, who brought me in and my first couple jobs were hanging banners at movie premieres and going to concerts the radio station had on. Uh, but again, super fun stuff. Fairly early on, I think it was one of the summers I was there, I was given the station vehicle to drive around town in. So I had the big branded thing with the call letters it's off the side. completely wrapped in everything, Tot the logo. Totally wrapped. You can see it about six miles away. You could, <laughs> you could land planes and kind of see it drive around. But my one of the jobs I had was I was on the air three times a day, which was actually super fun. And I would be given free stuff to give out. So I would have not high value things. I mean, I would have con well, concert tickets and movie premiere passes. Occasionally, I just had literal chips and pop, like really basic things to give away. So I'd go on the air and say, hey, you know, it's Jamie. I'm, I'm in the prize vehicle. I'm on the corner of Peel and René Levesque. And the first five people to come find me, here's what I have for you. And for me, that was the first is sort of marketing 101 stuff. It was one of the earliest examples of the power of free stuff with people. Like what people will do for free stuff is actually pretty amazing. Because um, I saw, uh, you know, I'd be live on the air. I saw people literally cross four lanes of traffic as soon as I was saying it, nearly killing themselves, frankly, <laughs> to get a bag of pop or a chips or something of very low value. Um, but a good lesson in marketing and promotions and, and actually a great summer job as part of doing that. So it was, it was quite a fun gig. And after you graduated from Wilfrid Laurier, you stayed in radio. Just after I graduated, maybe my last summer after I graduated, uh, I got a job at CHFI in Toronto. So I, I just pivoted that promotions experience that I had in Montreal, did a lot of the same stuff for that station in Toronto and, and got a prize vehicle and did a lot of the same promotions and vehicle giveaways and things, uh, did it at the adult contemporary station here for CHFI. Was the goal to, to go to Toronto? Because I noticed in between years or during the summer in university, you went back to Montreal. Yeah. So was the goal then to move to Toronto, or did you just kind of say, hey, where is my career going to take me? Well, well, yeah, I think that was a big part of it. So I, when I when I go in between university, home was Montreal. So my family was there, my friends were there in the summer. So it was actually it was great to go home. Uh, summers in Montreal are awesome between all the festivals, jazz festivals and comedy festivals and everything. So it was very natural and happy for me to go home in the summers. Uh, but then when I graduated, it was clear to me that, A, I wanted to pursue this entertainment media thing. I didn't know what it was, really what I wanted to do. Uh, but but I also knew that the center of universe for media is in Toronto. I mean, ultimately, and this was true 20 years ago, and it's true now, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the entertainment world lives here, the Canadian basis of it. So it was clear that I had to set this as a home base to look for the kind of jobs that I wanted to find. So CHFI was a stepping stone. It was a part of summer gig in that. Uh, but ultimately, when I graduated, uh, I blitzed my resume to every media company uh, I could apply to. So you, you name it, I sent them a resume, uh, often in the marketing and promotion side, because that was the area that I had a bit of experience in just based on my previous gigs, and just tried to knock on every door I could find kind of along the way. Deliver them in person... I think, how'd you go? Like, I, I mail them in? I did everything. Everything I, in possible? In person, I called, I followed up. You know, even email was pretty early. This was early days of email, I will say at that point. Uh, but did anything I can just to get people's attention uh, in terms of custom creating things and just, just being in people's faces and, and being persistent, which is probably always a good rule. No, I hear you. When I was applying for jobs in university, a lot of people, like I'd say early 2000s, I mean, job boards hadn't ca caught on. So I used to print out my resume and my cover letter on neon green paper. Because yep. I figured they looked at a stack of white ones, and they'd yep. be like, who the heck is this? That's right. And people told me, we pulled you in only because we saw this green paper, and we wanted to know who the guy was. Well, well that's true. And it's probably true to this day that I mean, it's not as much paper as much as it is other methods of, of applying these days. But ultimately, there's lots of great candidates out there and lots of really great people, and you need to stand out. And you do anything you can to be seen. I, I say that both as someone who, you know, in earlier days was looking to be seen, and now who 
hires people that you ultimately you 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 know you you, you think about the people that stand out and, and do things to get noticed. And people today email me and cold call me, and I try to respond to as uh, as many of them as I can, and try to meet as many of them as I can because that's how you sort of find people. So you try to be receptive to that. After CHFI, you yep. moved to Alliance Atlantis. Yep, company is no longer around. So take tell us about your role at Alliance Atlantis, and tell us a bit about the company. So I was there uh, actually before Alliance and Atlantis even came together. So so I started first at Alliance Broadcasting. Okay. It was a division of, of a bigger company that Robert Lantos ran at the time. Uh, and I worked in the broadcast area. So the broadcast business was two cable channels. It was a channel called Showcase, which had launched two or three years prior to me yep. starting. And History Television, History Channel, which literally launched six months before I got there. So these were sort of two early days cable channels and came in in an entry level role, again, kind of using marketing as a pivot in. Um, and I did th one of three things. It was a kind of a hybrid role. It was a little bit of brand strategy, marketing strategy stuff. It was uh, viewer relations. So I was on the guy on the phone and it was phone calls those days where when we would air something that would offend someone and showcase in those days had certain things that would offend people. Uh, it was known for being an edgy station. It, it was totally known for being an edgy station. So when we aired whatever filth we aired along the way, uh, <laughs> you know, people would call me and say, how could you air the show or what about that? Or that offended me. And, and you know, obviously I have to deal with those complaints and, and, and understand their concerns. So I did that. And I'll, I will say that was a great lesson in understanding your viewers and talking to your viewers and what they're looking for and what their concerns are. So a good 101 on that side of things. Uh, and then I also, I was actually the first online employee ever at Alliance Atlantis. So in those days, my job, websites were early days, it's 97, 98. I was the guy that was updating the showcase and history websites, like the scheduling information, the series information, a lot of HTML coding and that sort of thing. Uh, that group, obviously, you know, in the world of those channels have gone to many owners and we could talk about kind of the path of some of those because I, I went along with them kind of along the way. Uh, but that, that became obviously a giant team, but I was the one guy running the websites kind of at that point. Um, but it was really clear to me early on that of all those three things that I was doing, the brand strategy, the marketing stuff was the stuff that I had the most interest in, the most passion for. Uh, and I told my bosses at the time, hey, if, if you get more of this kind of stuff, if there's opportunity, I'd love to do more of that. And Alliance went through a whole lot of growth. So very quickly, Alliance and Atlantis merged. Atlantis was a company run by Michael McMillan, whose history I had lots of connections with to this day, obviously. Uh, and Michael uh, founded Atlantis and uh, merged with Alliance. Those companies came together. That was my first meeting with him. And then ultimately, over seven years that, that I was there for, that company wrote a lot of growth, uh, certainly in general, but on the broadcast business where I was. So we went from two channels, the Showcase and History channel. When Atlantis came in, we added what was then called Life Network, now called Slice Network, mm -hmm. and HGTV Canada. Those were already existing on the Atlantis side of things. Within a year of that, we launched Food Network in Canada. So we were five channels. And two years after that, back in 2001, we launched, uh, this was the explosion, the famous explosion of digital channels into the ecosystem. So in one day on September 10th, 2001, we launched uh, six channels at Alliance Atlantis. And I worked on a bunch of those launches, BBC Canada, National Geographic Channel, Showcase Action, what was then called Showcase Diva. Uh, there's a whole bunch, BBC Kids, there's a whole bunch of those channels. So the company uh, was growing. And so I was able to write a lot of growth over that period of time. And it's kind of a double-edged sword for you guys because you have two objectives. One, get people to subscribe to your channels, and once they do that, get them to watch. That's right. Because you need the subscriber revenue, and then you need the audience for the ad revenue. That's right. And, and as, you know, as I kind of grew my career in the consumer marketing side, it was both. You were sort of building your brand uh, to drive that subscription side. You know, What is Food Network? What is HGTV? These were really clearly branded ecosystems and great content that went with them. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of what we did was to drive that tune-in part, to drive that audience and that advertising part that you mentioned. So we were, you know, we were doing campaigns and uh, had a lot of fun creating big show brands. So one of the brands we built on Showcase was Trailer Park Boys. You know, I was there mm -hmm. in the early, early days. Uh, I was there before we put Trailer Park Boys on the air. And, and I'll tell you, for those that know Trailer Park Boys, before the first episode went to air, uh, I looked at this thing saying, really, we're going we're gonna to put this show on television? <laughs> this, is, this is a TV show? And I give credit, I have to say, to a couple specific people, Phyllis Yaffe that ran our broadcast business, and Laura Michael Chishin, who really was the head of programming and the person that guided Showcase and its growth who uh, said, Laura said, this is going to be a hit. This is a show that's going to work. 
and uh, we put it on the air, and it was quite fun uh, through a number of years riding the wave of the real phenomenon that became Trailer Park Boys and dealing with those guys. That's that's one example of building show-specific brands, building big hit television and kind of the connection that it had with people. And that was a good ride, actually. And Trailer Park Boys had a kind of a global cult phenomenon or yeah. following because when I was living in Britain for a bit, the odd person would be like, didn't your country give us Trailer Park Boys? And I'd be like, that's what you know us for? So that's it's interesting. That started it. I'll tell you, I mean, the story of Trailer Park Boys was we put it on uh, the way we did Trailer Park Boys, and it was often short seasons, that show. So we would do eight or ten episodes, and Trailer Park Boys was a was not a big hit uh, until, I'll tell you, between somewhere between season two and season three. So we put the first season on the air. It did okay. Renewed it, put a second season on the air. It grew a little bit. It did fine. Between season two and season three, um, Our Lady Peace called, the, the big Canadian band. Yep. And they called and they said, hey, we, we love these trailer park guys. We're going on a cross-country tour. We'd love these guys to come out with us. And we'd love them to appear. We think they'd be awesome on stage. And uh, in the marketing department, the programming department, we had a chat and we said, really? Like, you want to bring the trailer park boys out? And, uh, you know, a few of us said, is anyone going to know these guys? Like, they're going to go on stage. We want to make sure it goes well and that they're received well. And we weren't sure if anyone would even know who they were, quite honestly, when they, when they went on stage. Again, Showcase was a fairly small cable channel. It wasn't a big conventional network. It didn't have quite the reach of a CTV or a global. So we had this little cult show on a small cable channel or mid-sized cable channel at the time. And we weren't sure how they'd be received. And they went on the Our Lady Peace tour. And they went out in that first tour. It was Kingston they were at or wherever, all the cities that Our Lady Peace went to. And they went on stage between sets of Our Lady Peace. And they got a thunderous applause. Like you would not have believed the reaction the Trailer Park Boys got. Just every stadium they went to, every theater arena they went to, they were the hit of the show. Like they just got such a fan reaction. And it said to it said to us in the marketing department, okay, there's something here. These guys are connecting. They're finding an audience. Like these, these people know these guys. And for us, actually, it was we started to market season three. The new season was coming out, and we said we got to put some gasoline on this fire. Like we actually launched our biggest campaign for them out of season three. We thought there was some pop culture things starting to kind of stir, and and you know we worked with the guys, and we said we got to ride this thing and see where it goes. And season three and season four and season five, it started to become the real pop culture phenomenon that you might think it to be uh, to the point where, you know, these guys are and were big Canadian celebrities. And, you know, I would go to events with them or we literally would walk down Bloor Street. Like it, it was super fun when you're walking down Bloor Street with the trailer park boys who – the actors and the characters aren't all that different. They're, you know, they're in the same ecosystem. You mean the actor who plays Bubbles doesn't wear those glasses? He, he does care. not wear those glasses. <laughs> I don't want to give away too many secrets, but he does not wear those glasses. But Ricky and Julian, they're Ricky and Julian pretty much. <laughs> and you'd walk down the street and they look like their characters. You know, they, they, they're not that far from their characters. Really great guys. And, uh, you know, I would walk down the street and, Cars, people would be honking their horns, and FedEx drivers would be opening the door, going, "Hey, Ricky, Bubbles, Julian," and they would just it was fun, and they just loved it. So it was kind of fun to see the phenomenon that we created there. No better focus group than taking them to a stadium and having a couple thousand people yeah, just go nuts. 15, when they stand 15 20 thousand people, like big arenas that Our Lady Peace would play, big band, uh, and you know, seeing what they would do, it was actually great. And they weren't even they weren't even a band, so they just kind of went up on stage and said a couple of words. I no, guess they were just guys that drank beer and had Ryan Cokes and <laughs> just had fun and they just did their shtick, their Trailer Park Boys thing and they had a thunderous applause and just had such, people just loved them and they're such lovable guys so that was fun. From there you moved to Can West though. Talk yep. a little bit about the move. Did the role find you? Did you find the role? And so, what did it entail there? So the, the story is uh, I worked for seven years uh, there's a guy that hired me at Alliance in the early days, a mentor of mine named Walter Levitt and Walter hired me to my Alliance job back in early 98 when I started at Alliance. And seven years later, uh, 2005, Walter uh, got a job as the head of uh, CMO of CanWest. CanWest was kind of investing, doing some new things. Global uh, was really, uh, you know, Global had some tough days and they were looking to really reinvest and bring Global back and compete really effectively against CTV and kind of renew that business a little bit. And so there's lots of new folks that joined uh, CanWest back in 2005. And Walter uh, left. We had a good experience working together and called me at one point and said, hey, you know, I have this job for you at Global as he, as he kind of settled in there. It's uh, director of marketing for Global Television, doing all the primetime entertainment stuff. 
And for me, it was a great new opportunity because I'd spent seven years in cable and in specialty marketing and had a great experience at Alliance Atlantis and a lot of fun with, with great people. But I was looking for a bit of a change. And for me, you know, having spent that time in specialty to make the leap to conventional TV to market big primetime series. And at the time I went over and, and Global had House and Survivor and Prison Break and eventually Glee and some big primetime international hit shows. A lot of the shows that Fox was producing, it was, it's kind of like a lot of the broadcasters would pair up with an American broadcaster. And I always knew that about Global and Can West was yeah. if it was on Fox, more than likely Global would pick it up. Well, I mean, it's true for CTV. I mean, the game in conventional is uh, you go, and uh, in prime time it is, you go and you buy great big American shows traditionally, you license them, you simulcast them in Canada, and you monetize those shows in Canada as the rights holder here. And so each of the networks had affiliations and relationships, but we looked at all the U.S. product that was coming out, uh, and, and this is the annual pilgrimage to L.A. in, in May when the, the buying season sort of happens for the Canadian broadcasters and all the world broadcasters, really and picked up every year new hit shows and, and there was real competition between Global and CTV and City TV to see who was going to buy the the new hit shows of the year. But the game was, you know, these were big primetime hits and how are you driving mass, mass audience? And again, for me, I'm now marketing shows that draw millions of viewers every weeknight, sort of that next level up of a big, broad audience. So that was a great leap for me to make that change over to CanWest. So you grew within the company all the way up to VP of Marketing Strategy. Take us a little bit about what that role entailed specifically. Yeah, so uh, basically started more in a director of marketing role on the entertainment side, but again, managed to kind of grow my portfolio over the you know five, six years I was at CanWest. And at the time, about two years after I got there, actually, CanWest bought my old company, Alliance Atlantis. So uh, amazingly, I was back working with a lot of the same people I'd worked with for seven years at Alliance Atlantis. This is 2007 when that transaction happened. But I was really on the, spe uh, the, the conventional side of things. A lot of my former colleagues at Alliance Atlantis built that specialty business as those businesses came together. And I was able to keep writing, um, you know, with some growth, new opportunities on the global side of things. So I started first with a portfolio that was based on the entertainment, that primetime product. But as I uh, progressed, I took on new responsibilities as sort of with those promotions and, and things to take a broader mandate on Global. So Global is both its entertainment product, but it's also its news product, both its national news and its local news, which is a big part of that Global television product as well. Uh, and so I started to work on news marketing, which is very different than entertainment, different rhythm, different goals, uh, you know, and, and got the opportunity to work both with our national newscast and our local newscast, which was a great new experience for me. It was just a great new challenge, and I very much enjoyed that. So it was part of, of broadening my, my portfolio as I kind of grew in that space. We already established that you started on the, in the trenches, on the ground floor, on the radio side, grew, grew all the way up to VP of marketing. During that time, though, I imagine you had to relinquish a lot of the a lot of the intermediary, intermediary duties you were doing and you shifted more to managing people. Was there a bit of an adjustment period for you going, okay, I can't touch that campaign anymore or I'm not supposed to do that at, at that level anymore because I'm more of the coach than the quarterback anymore? Yeah, I mean, that, that started to be a shift. I mean, I certainly started to manage people and took on teams as I got more senior in my career, even at brand manager and director of marketing. You started to manage groups and, and, and you know, uh, that was a bit of a shift. But I'll, I'll say that probably the biggest shift happened in my next role. So, uh, uh, in that move, Ken West ended up going through, as is well reported, a whole bunch of challenges uh, around the time of all the market collapse stuff about yeah, 2008. 2008. There was a whole process through uh, – back. Canvas went into CCAA, into bankruptcy protection, through a whole bunch of creditor and bank stuff that was going on. Ultimately, we just stayed out of it and kept running our business, and we was kind of out of uh, our scope. We just wanted to keep people focused on what they were doing. But out of that process, Shaw Communications came in and bought the, ass, the broadcast assets at Can West. And so I got a different job at that point. She, my boss at the time left when Shaw came in to come into Can West. And I got the job uh, as head of as basically head of marketing for Sh what became Shaw Media. So I was running global and the 18 specialty channels at that point. And I was managing a team of about 200 people. Uh, and to your point around, you know, that being a different job, a different kind mm -hmm. of thing, it definitely got to the point where I had a great, I mean, 200 people, you have a great big team across brand strategy and creative and communications and a big portfolio of people that were working on all parts of that business. And by the time any campaign got to me as the head of marketing, uh, it was pretty good. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it had gone through layers of people in an organization from brand managers to directors to VPs. Uh, and you know, I, I had a great senior team at the time uh, who were great at what they did. And so 
yeah, I was doing less marketing stuff. I was doing a little more people and firefighting and that sort of thing. And I missed, I missed a bit of that stuff. Uh, I, I futzed with things that I was interested in a little bit, which probably annoyed some of my reports, <laughs> but, but it was a different kind of job and it was a different experience uh, and a good experience to kind of look at it uh, at a different level for sure. Interesting thing about that acquisition, Shaw of Can West's assets. Shaw is a telco company, and they were one of the telco companies that did not have any media assets or any yep. media division. So when they bought you guys, they were buying something completely brand new. Did the corporate culture change much? For, for sure, in that it, it was a company that there were two very different businesses coming together. And in many cases, businesses that were on two sides of the fence. I mean, you had kind of the distribution side where Shaw came from and the media channel side where we were. And, you know, there's a very traditional relationship of, of customer and, you know, they, they pay us for our channels. And there's just a bit of a natural different kind of relationship there. So all of a sudden we were one company. And it did, it, it, I think on both sides, it took us a little while to understand. There was a real level of understanding of both businesses. As you come together, I had a really great crash course in the cable business and the wireless business and the, in the internet business and which drove Shaw as a company. And I think vice versa, there was a learning curve on there and as to how a media company works and the factors you think about and the, the, all that, all those things. So I think just as two businesses coming together, there was a natural curve that happened, but it also brought in my view to the industry hugely in terms of understanding a whole other part of the ecosystem, which was super super helpful. And, and, and yeah, on the culture side, for sure, there are different companies come together. This is true of every acquisition mm -hmm. I've ever seen. I saw it with Cam West and Alliance Atlantis coming together. I saw it with Alliance and Alliance and Atlantis coming together. Uh, and with Cam West and, and Shaw coming in, you end up with uh, different, cult, uh, different cultures, different rhythms of doing things. And that takes a natural time to work its way out. And, and then ultimately, a new culture is often created when, yep, that's true. when, when things come together. Uh, but that takes a bit of time at first to kind of get through there. From there, that brings us to where you're at now, yeah. Blue Ant Media. Did you find the role or did the role find you? The role found me. So I, uh, well, yeah, probably that's how I would describe it. <laughs> I left Can West as early 2013, sorry, uh, Shaw Media as early sort of 2013 and was looking for something different and, and, you know, had been in these big vertically integrated places. And very early on in the time after I left Shaw, uh, I met Raja Khanna and Raja was the CEO of Blue Ant at the time. The company itself was only two years old in its current form. So if just to take a step back to the Blue Ant story mm -hmm. a little bit. It. Blue Ant was founded in 2011. It was founded by Michael McMillan, who had you know, built and sold Alliance Atlantis and had gone away uh, after that company was sold to do other things. But uh, Michael always had a passion for media. It's, it's Michael's blood. It's really his mm -hmm. history of what he does. So in 2011, he and his partner from Alliance Atlantis, Seton McLean, uh, decided to form an, a new kind of media company. I mean, this was around the time when there was just so much di digital disruption that we live in to this moment. You know, YouTube really had taken off and Netflix was just emerging and Facebook and all the things that we know about in terms of the real social media digital ecosystem changes. And Michael wanted to create a different kind of media company. And ultimately, uh, uh, partnered with Raja Khanna. Raja was running uh, some digital pr uh, things and, and some TV channels at the time. Through some M and A, he came on board to Blue Ant, and Blue Ant did a num a num num another a bit of M and A off the top to form, you know, our assets of our Canadian channels and eventually Cottage Life magazine and other things that we put together. So I met Raja about two years into Blue Ant in its current shape, and early on we sat down and you know Raja took me through the vision for Blue Ant, a bit of the kind of the traditional five-year plan of mm -hmm. what we're trying to do and where we're trying to go. And it was early days. And uh, I was intrigued by what the company was doing. I certainly, you know, I liked Raja immediately. We hit it off very well. And I knew other folks that used to, that I used to work with that now lived in the Blue Ant world. So uh, a couple other people, Vanessa Case was running the content team at the time and Megan Atkinson, who was running HR. These are people that I knew from Alliance Atlantis or Can West or other worlds. And ultimately, uh, you know, just liked what I saw of the company, of the culture, of what they were building here. So, so joined uh, at that point. You started as EVP of Marketing. And then you pivoted to EVP of, was it Canadian Media? Yep, well, Canadian Networks. Sorry, Canadian time, Networks. But it became what we call Canadian Media today, yeah. What was the difference between the two roles? So the, the marketing role when I came in was, again, a role that I had done in other places. It really was to run all the, the B2B, B2C, comms, creative for the, the channel brands in Canada and for the, the business that was sort of very quickly growing around the world, but with its, with its roots here in Canada. So I came in to do a lot of the same stuff that I had done at Shaw Media, that I had done at Can West and Alliance Atlantis, and it's a world I, I knew and was very comfortable in. Um, but, you know, I, I did say to Raja early on, hey, as the company's growing, 
if there was a way to kind of pivot my responsibilities and, and look to make the move uh, just from the marketing function to more of a general management type job, I'd be interested in that. And Blue Ant has and was growing fairly quickly, both on the domestic side and on the international side. So about two years after I got here, Raja came to me and said, hey, you know, we're looking at the structure of the business and we think we need to just change up how we're set up and how the roles are aligned a little bit. Uh, and we set up business units within Blue Ant just to sort of change the structure. And that's the pivot that I made from more of a marketing focus role to more of a business manager role, really a general manager role. And I took sort of the early parts of responsibility for our Canadian business at that time. And that's a that I've sort of uh, grown in in the past number of years. And where it's brought to you to where you are now? That's El right. Presidente. Uh, yeah, well, we don't call it that often, but El Presidente. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's the role that I've been now running in that Canadian business, which I just love doing, and it's been a great ride. Looking back at some of the other guests that I've had on the podcast, a lot of them have had many different roles, been at many different companies, but you've been at very few companies but had many different roles. Uh, you seem to have nailed internal growth. What's the secret to that? So, uh, you know, here's my two cents. I mean, yeah, I've been very lucky and successful, and there's lots of reasons why I think that's the case, uh, not the least of which is, you know, hard work. Uh, for sure, you got to work it at any place you're at. And people notice how I work. People notice passionate people who are excited about what they do. Um, that's no doubt a part of it. Uh, I will say luck is a part of everyone's career. There's something about just being in the right place at the right time, yep. and you can't, and I don't discount just what luck has had in my career, and I think that's part of it as well. Um, I mean, the other couple of thoughts uh, I would share or maybe have on that is, one, uh, being candid about what you want to do. I mean, just I'll say as a, a manager myself, one of the things I often say to my my team, my reports is, you know, I want to help you in your career. I'd like to find roles that you're interested in and help people on their career path, but I'm not a mind reader. I mean, ultimately, uh, everyone's career as much as, and we'll talk about mentors in a sec, I think mentors are a part of it, as much as mentors are important, you're all responsible for your own career path. I mean, you're, you're the most responsible for your own career path. And the best you can do with your manager is be honest about what you want and what you want to go to next. And that has proven true in my career to be, to be vocal about, hey, I'd, I'd like this job, or if this person leaves, that's the kind of job that I want. Um, again, as a manager, we don't always know that's the case. And, and it's not that you're always going to get that role or that we could deliver that or that's always possible. And for sure, there's been jobs, gigs that I wanted that I didn't get along the way to. Uh, that's natural. But at the same time, uh, being candid around what you're thinking about to help guide your own career is part of it. And, and for sure, good Good mentors is truly important. And in my career, uh, I've been blessed about some great mentors kind of along the way. And there's a big group of people I'd put into that list um, who have helped me, who have guided me, who have given me advice, who had different styles that I were able to take things I liked and in some cases things I didn't like actually too kind of along the way uh, and kind of helped me in my career growth. But, but mentors are important in people's career as well. And uh, finding good mentors and building those relationships is something you have to work at and kind of actively think about. When I speak at colleges and universities about career paths, and I do do that from time to time, I always tell them, when you get paid, take 20 bucks off your paycheck, 30 bucks, put it into a jar, and take your mentors out for breakfast. Everyone's available for breakfast. Not lunch or dinner, but breakfast everyone seems to be available for. For, for uh, sure. I mean, finding ways to connect, to keep your network of people up. Uh, you know, I, I think about it both ways now that, that, you know, I, that helped me very early in my career and through my career was having great mentors. And I try to do that, you know, as well to give back on the flip side now. And I'm in a role where I'm able to help people with career and help people find opportunities. Uh, and I think about it uh, on the reverse now is, you know, how can I be a good mentor? How can, how can I help groom and uh, give people opportunities that they're looking for? So it, it is kind of a karma thing. It goes both ways. Yeah, it does. And, and I think it's part of, you know, how uh, good leaders are, are built as well. If you could go back in time and give your younger self advice, what would you say? <laughs> I've always been pretty type A, uh, you know, wanting to control a whole bunch of stuff. And, and you know, young in your career, you're you're not sure where you're going. I certainly had lots of ambitions about things I wanted to do and, and career growth and all that kind of stuff. I would actually probably look back. There's a there's a phrase I often use. I, it was actually an old mentor of mine uh, who used it. Uh, I'm pretty sure he copied it from Star Trek Three, uh, the search <laughs> for Spock. Uh, but but the phrase is the universe unfolds as it should. And I can tell you that in my career. Uh, that has proven to be absolutely the case. As I, as, you know, in my experience at Blue Ant and in other people's careers that you know we, we manage here and that I work with, um, the universe unfolds as it should has been a general mantra that has been absolutely true to me. And, and I think if I went back to uh, twenty 
something year ago, Jamie, and share some thoughts, it would probably be just don't worry, the universe unfolds as it should and, and things will be good. So, and you don't always see that. I mean, ultimately people's careers take left turns and right turns and, and jobs come and go and sometimes by your choice, sometimes not by your choice. And that's just the journey we're kind of all on. Um, but the universe unfolds as it should. And I think that's true. My signature closing question, yeah. if you weren't in media, what would you be doing and why? Probably, it's funny, I always had a, an interest in the hospitality world. I, I can't know why, but the idea of hotels and that world specifically, I've always just find it a fascinating business, sort of what happens in hospitality. Um, so probably uh, that and my passion or growing need for warm weather, actually, <laughs> uh, I, I would actually probably look at... Uh, emulating Caribbean life, which is a show I do watch on HGTV from time to time, uh, and run a hotel, get into the hospitality business, but probably do it down south somewhere uh, in a nice warm climate. So uh, a Caribbean life hotel management type role sounds pretty good to me, actually. Considering how cold it is right now, yeah, that sounds they, great. Yeah, it's going to get a little colder, I think. <laughs> so, so that's the plan. Jamie, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. That's it for today's show. For more episodes, you can go to soundcloud.com slash media people podcast or subscribe on your favorite podcast service like Apple Podcasts or CastBox. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Vic Genova.